Hi, welcome to our broadcast today. I'm Ken Bear, a pastor at Faith Dialogue, a non-denominational ministry here in Celebration, Florida. Uh, we work cooperatively with all the area churches in Celebration, Florida, including Celebration Community Church, Corpus Christi Catholic Church, Community Presbyterian Church, Illuminate Church, Celebration Anglican Fellowship, and Celebration Seventh-day Adventist Church. Today, our call to worship is from the Old Testament prophet Malachi. This is uh, Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. From the rising of the sun to the setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Today our worship is provided by our own D. Bellavati. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassion, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever. Great is thy faithfulness. 
Hi, welcome to our broadcast today. Today we're continuing in our study of the book of Acts and our study called Unstoppable. We're in chapter 8 and we're going to try to get through the first 25 verses of chapter 8. We continue this, we continue this study and we're calling it Unstoppable because we see that a good description of the church especially as recorded in the book of Acts, is, is unstoppable. Uh, when we say the church, by the way, we mean the big C church, uh, the church universal. It's comprised of every man, woman, and child that knows Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's not bound by sectarianism, denominationalism, creeds, rites, ceremonies, language, or geography. It is a church that has Jesus Christ as the head, and in, in, in which he has made all of us, all of us disciples, kings and priests to our God, all of us ministers of the gospel. Uh, and the gospel is nothing other than the good news of, of Jesus Christ. Je Jesus promised that he would build his church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Uh, the title of my message today is The Church Responds. In our, study of, in, in our study of the book of Acts, we have gone through the, the first seven chapters. Fear, hardship, persecution, martyrdom are the things that the church has and continues to overcome. Today, we're picking up immediately where we left off um, just last week in, in chapter 7 of the book of Acts, where we saw the account of Stephen. Uh, one of the very first deacons. He was one of the initial seven selected by the people and ordained by the apostles because they were men of character and, full, and filled with the Holy Spirit. In Stephen, we saw a, a wonderful man of faith and a powerful witness for the Lord that became the first martyr of the church. Stephen was stoned to death by an angry mob 
after preaching to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. And he showed how all of the pivotal events of the Old Testament, all of the history of the Jewish people, all pointed to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We also saw that there was a man named Saul, a Pharisee that was present, and the scriptures say, and the witnesses, that is the stone throwers, laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So let's continue today in chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. It says, in my Bible, it says, Saul persecutes the church. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. This eighth chapter in the book of Acts is considered a transitional chapter. We'll see that the church that initially had to respond to uh, rapid growth, uh, where initially thousands and then what we saw were tens of thousands of people committed their life to Christ and were baptized, um, that then the apostles also were preaching with great signs and wonders. Uh, now it's a transitional chapter. We call it a transitional chapter for a number of reasons. In, in this passage, we see that the church is going to move out move out from Jerusalem and begin to minister to both the Jews as well as the Gentiles. We'll also begin to see that the ministry is going to transition from solely the apostles to other men. Not only Stephen, and we'll meet a man named Philip, but other men, other men of faith that continue the work that the apostles started. Finally, it's a transitional chapter because Luke, the author, starts to turn his attention to, to Saul, who would later be called Paul the Apostle. And we'll see that Luke, uh, who's focused on Peter and the Apostles at the beginning of the book of Acts, will transition as well, as will follow Paul the Apostle through his missionary journeys. However, Paul is still Saul the Pharisee, so he has a long way to go from here. Uh, the chapter starts off with these words. It says, Saul was consenting to his death. Whose death? Well, that's Stephen. In some of our translations, it will start off by saying, and Saul was consenting to his death. The word and tells us that this is a continuation of what we saw in the previous chapter. In fact, when the Bible was written, it was written as one book, one summary, one text. The chapters and verses that are, are so convenient today to be able to follow along and find where we are and to be able to memorize scripture, those chapters and verses were added, added much later. The, Saul is, is key here. Saul's not part of the story because he eventually would become very famous and would be, be Paul the Apostle. Saul is be a part of the story because he is the catalyst. He's the catalyst for this persecution that, that broke out in Jerusalem. We'll hear in the next chapter that Saul actually went to the high priest to ask for letters that he could deliver to the synagogues so that he, if he found any men and women belonging to this, this, this organization or this group of followers of Jesus Christ called the Way, he could bring them back as prisoners to Jerusalem. When the scripture says that Paul was consenting to the death, it means that he gave his, his full approval. Um, he, Paul may, Saul may have been seen as the highest ranking person uh, in the mob. Uh, he was a Pharisee. While today stoning is considered barbaric, and while it is still practiced in many countries, it's, it's illegal not only in the United States, but all, all Western democracies. Uh, it was also illegal in Jerusalem at the time, uh, at the time of Saul and, and Stephen. Uh, you have to understand, however, that the Romans made it illegal not because they considered it barbaric. They, they considered it illegal because they had a much, horrific, much more horrific way of killing someone, and that was crucifixion. So because it was illegal, it was considered, this, this action of, of Stephen, this, this stoning, 
was considered a, a mob action. It was never officially sanctioned by the Jewish leaders. Uh, sanctioning would make them culpable. However, we see that Saul was, was, <laughs> Saul was fully engaged. In the previous chapter, in verse 58, it says that they laid down their clothes. They laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Uh, what does it mean to, that the people who were taking off their robes, what it means is that they were, they were freeing up their throwing arm. And they were getting rid of the bulky outer clothes so that they could throw stones. We also believe that Saul was likely one of the men in the synagogues that was losing the argument to Stephen. The scripture says this, it says, and they, that refers to the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which, that is, Stephen spoke. So Stephen was, was winning the argument. So if you, if you can't win the argument, what do you do? Well, you malign and you smear the character of the other person. And if that isn't enough, you get worthless men to lie about him, so that, lie about what he actually said. This was Saul. Saul was a, a Pharisee. He was a, a brilliant man. He was a leader, and he was very zealous for Judaism, and now he was just as zealous about killing Christians. God is going to be able to use that in the, in the near future, but presently, persecution is breaking out in Jerusalem because of Saul. The scripture continues and says that a, a great persecution arose, and that the people decided to scatter, to escape throughout Judea and Samaria. However, the apostles decided to stay in Jerusalem. So let's make an assumption. It's just an assumption, but I think it's a pretty good assumption that Satan is behind this, this persecution. And why not? Satan figures, well, Jesus rose from the dead, but if I can stomp it out, if I can kill all of the followers of Jesus, of Nazareth, maybe I can stop this before it gets too big. The Bible is clear, however, that it is not Satan but God that is sovereign. God always has a plan. And often, and often what the devil or a man does with evil intentions, God actually allows for the good. If you remember, one of the youngest sons of Jacob was, was Joseph. And Joseph was the youngest son, the, the, the favored son of, of Jacob. And Jacob gave him a coat of many colors. Maybe you saw the movie. Um, the, the brothers of Joseph hated him, hated him because he was the favorite son and hated that he was, he was given this, this coat of many colors. So they decided that they were going to kill him. They had a better idea and they actually sold him into slavery and Joseph ended up being a slave in Egypt. Well, a few years later, the brothers are headed to, to Egypt in order to see if they can buy some, some produce there because of the famine in the land. And they meet Joseph. They don't know who it's Joseph at the time, but Joseph is number two, number two to only Pharaoh, one of the, one of the leaders, in the, the leader in the land of Egypt. And, and Joseph says something very interesting. He says, he says, you meant this for evil, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about to this day to save many people. You know, the church has grown, not despite, but because of, of persecution. In the first three centuries until the Edict of Milan in, in 313 that basically allowed Christians uh, to be able to practice the, and, and worship God, uh, there were numerous waves of, of persecutions. The Romans considered the Christians, uh, the Christian beliefs to be superstitions. And they actually called the Christians atheists. Now, that seems interesting to you and me that we would be called atheists. But from a Roman perspective, if the Christians didn't believe in the gods of Rome, all these pagan gods, then they were, they were atheists. No one knows the actual number of Christians that were killed. But the persecution including, included many other things. Uh, stripping the Christians of their property. Uh, many of them had to meet secretly. Their churches were burned. Many were thrown in jail. They were denied many government jobs, including military service. This persecution, however, history shows us, actually facilitated the growth of Christianity. 
you know, I don't have the opportunity today to do as many uh, mission trips as I, as I used to. Uh, and I really never had the opportunity to go into Muslim lands. However, missionary friends tell me that, that Iran, uh, which is one of the most hostile environments to Christians, is one of the fastest growing underground church movements in the world. I talked with Franklin Graham. What, a, what an honor for me to talk with Franklin Graham. This is back in uh, mid-2005-2006. And he said that their missionary work that the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association was doing in China uh, was amazing. Uh, that there was tremendous growth in China, not only in the underground church, but also when it was the official 3C church. Amazing growth despite church leaders being arrested, church be buildings being demolished, Christian symbols, including crosses, pictures of Jesus, and Bibles being burned. I want you to notice that in the scripture today, and while, while most of the people scattered, some decided to stay. Who decided to stay? Well, the apostles. Uh, we want to make sure, I want to make sure that we don't believe somehow that when persecution uh, arises, how one people respond is the only way to respond. Um, there's only, not only one way for Christians to respond. Every person has to decide in their own heart what the action is that they'll do uh, when they're faced with, with trials and, and tribulations. You know, some people believe today that we're being persecuted here in the United States. Uh, because, of, because of the outbreak of the virus, many of our churches are closed and many others are, have to limit their capacity or to have their attendees wear masks or both. We hear that in California, for example, uh, the governor completely closed a number of churches, and then in other churches, he told them they weren't able to sing. In Nevada, casinos may be open, but churches may not. Now, I'm not going to comment on whether this is actually persecution, or it just seems to be persecution compared to the amazing uh, civic liberties and religious liberties that we normally enjoy. As a pastor, however, I want to remind all of us that we are the, the body of Christ. And when any one member of the body of Christ suffers, we all suffer. Also, different churches have different pastors, have different leadership. And as a result, different pastors decide to respond differently when they're told to close or when they're told to respond in some way um, to, the, to the government officials. Uh, some churches, they believe that God has told them to, to follow the guidelines. Other churches, they believe that God has told them to, to carry on. God is not limited. God can use both for his glory. Don't be so quick to judge one church or another because they might not be doing what you think might be wise or what your own church is doing. I would also encourage you that if, if your church is open, during this pandemic. If your church has opened the doors, and even if they're making you wear a mask or stand, stand six feet apart, you need to be there. You need to be, to be worshiping God. But as believers, we need to be in worship. We need to be in fellowship. We need to be in prayer for one another. Not only individually, but collectively. The Bible says that it's when two or more are gathered. You, you need to be with other Christians. If your pastor has opened the doors of your church, be there. Period. Find a way to accommodate any uncomfortable feeling you have. Just, just get over it. Now, back to the scripture for today. We see some decided to, to scatter, while others decided to gather in Jerusalem. God is able to use both for his glory. Verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations for him. As for Saul, he made havoc in the church. Now, Stephen was, was well known. The scriptures say that by his hand there were signs and, and wonders, miracles accomplished that would make him, him well known and well liked. Stephen was also, remember, doing double duty. He, he, was, he was serving as a deacon, as they had told him, to be able to, to take care of the, of the widows, the, widows the, the, the women and children. He was supposed to do that. That's what the deacon's assignment was. But Stephen also decided to go and preach to be able to go to the synagogues and tell the people in the synagogues um, about Jesus. Well, taking care of the tables and his one signs and wonders made him very, very popular. But preaching Jesus in these synagogues to these Jews, these religious Jews, got him stoned. 
It says that devout men carried Stephen, uh, they buried him and they wept for him. That's what making lamentations means. Uh, these devout men were likely devout Jews or possibly even devout Hellenists, which were Greek-speaking Jews. They were not likely believers, and, and I say this for, for two reasons. Uh, number one, if they were believers, Luke likely would have used the word brothers rather than devout men. And, and number two, persecution had broken out. And, and just as we read about Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret follower of Jesus Christ and, and went to Pilate to ask for the body of, of Jesus after the crucifixion and what courage that took. Imagine what courage and how dangerous it would have been for believers to go and ask for the body of, of, uh, of, of Stephen or carry the body of Stephen back so they could have him buried. And then the scripture continues talking about Saul. It says that he wrecked havoc on the church. Uh, the wording here is interesting. The wording of the two words particularly. First is this, uh, this idea of, of to make havoc. Make havoc literally means he exercised brutal and sadistic cruelty. It, it could be used, the Greek word could be used of a, a wild boar ravaging a vineyard or, or an animal savagely te tearing a, a body apart. And it's the same word here being translated made havoc. Made havoc. Or it could, use, it could say of Saul that he literally tore the church apart. The other word that's interesting is, is house. And while it's, it's, it, it means house and it's, and it's a great translation to be, uh, to be translated as house, it also can mean families. It was very obvious that Saul was coming after families. If a member of the family became a follower of Jesus, the whole family uh, was at risk. Now, Saul likely thought that he was doing good, that he was doing God a favor. Uh, it's like some Old Testament prophet tearing down idols and pagan shrines. Saul is determined to tear out this cancer that he calls Christianity, this, this cult of the Nazarene. Uh, at the time it was called the way. Uh, Saul is also being used by God, but not the way that Saul thinks. Persecution in the church drove the church out of Jerusalem and out to Samaria and then beyond. Stephen's martyrdom sent the church out from Jerusalem, out from the shadow of the temple, into Samaria, but then soon the church would be going into places like Antioch and, and the Greek cities of Thessalonica, uh, Cyprus, and Ephesus, and ultimately Rome. An amazing spread of the gospel that all started because of the persecution, all started because of Saul. So let's continue. We'll meet another one of the original seven servants of the Lord called deacons. Verse 4, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. So Philip was the one that was scattered. He went to Samaria and preached Christ to them. The gospel, Paul's gospel said that the gospel goes to the Jew first. But after the Jews had again rejected the gospel, uh, Philip and many of the others moved on. They moved to Samaria. And, Christ, and Philip is, is preaching Christ to them. If you recall, at the time, the Jews and the Samaritans were not exactly friends. In fact, it, the Jews hated the Samaritans and the Samaritans hated the Jews. Once the Apostle James asked Jesus if they should call down fire on a Samaritan village that had not been so receptive to a visit by Jesus and the disciples. The reason for this animosity, and it was, again, much more than animosity, um, was because 600 years prior, the Assyrians had come in and they conquered the, this northern land called Israel, which was home to 10 of the 12 tribes. And they carried many, a lot of the influential people, a lot of the wealthy people, but they carried many, many people away back to Assyria and they resettled the land with a lot of mixed people. So over time, these people intermarried. 600 years later, 
the time of Jesus, the people and the religion and the customs were radically different than what the Jews believed. If you remember, Jesus had an experience with a Samaritan woman at the well. That's in John 4. And the story illustrates both the divide between the Jews and the Samaritans as a culture, as well as the opportunity. Yet we see Philip preaching Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. You know, there's no better affirmation in ministry than having miracles follow you wherever you go. Uh, let me address very briefly these miracles. First of all, it was Philip that was preaching and doing the miracles. That's what the Bible says. It says, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. It was, it was Philip, not the apostles. Some teach that the age of miracles has passed because the apostles are gone. But here we see Stephen and also Philip doing these miracles. And we know today that miracles still happen every day and in some of the most unlikely places. Miracles, remember, are, are signs. They're signs of God's presence, God's pleasure, His purpose, and God's passion. God is the one that is sovereign, and He'll heal. He'll cast out demons, He'll raise the dead, He'll strengthen the lame, He'll give sight to the blind when God sees fit. You know, I've seen miracles. I've seen people recover from sicknesses. I've seen wounds he healed. I've seen sight uh, restored. I've seen hearing restored. At the same time, these truly miraculous, instantaneous healings, uh, they're pretty rare. They don't happen regularly. However, I do what I'm told to do. I pray, I believe, I lay hands on people, and I let God do the work. So this passage ends with the words, and there was great joy in the city. I would think so. When people are healed, when they hear the gospel and they're set free, when they're able to have the full use of their arms and their legs, when they can walk and they can jump and they're, and they're restored, joy follows. You know, there's actually a miracle waiting for every one of us. Did you know that? A miracle waiting for every one of us. Every one of us there will be a day when everyone that has died, as well as the generation that is still alive, Jesus will appear and instantly will be transformed. We, are, we will join our, our resurrected body, will be given a resurrected body that will function exactly the way that God has ordained. We'll be like Jesus resurrected and forever with the Lord, with ten fingers, ten toes, healthy, free of disease, no longer old or feeble, but young again. It'll be a, a glorious day. But let's continue. Verse 9. But there was a certain man named Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him, because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done." You know, as I, I just talked about miracles today, miracles and healings, um, because of what we read about Philip, and, and here we see that, that here's Philip casting out uh, demons. Uh, and remember, this is because of the sovereignty of God. However, here we're introduced to a certain man named Simon. And unlike many of the present-day fakes, the counterfeits, the people that claim that they're witches, they use magic spells and incantations, Simon, I believe, was the, was the real deal. He had fame. And it said that he was honored because of his so sorcery. And the people said of him, this man is the great power of God. In the Bible, sorcery is always associated with the occult. Whatever real power Simon had, it was from Satan, not God. There are instances in the Bible where sorcery or magic is used, and that power is, is never from God. It's always from Satan. 
For example, when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, and if you refuse, I'll send a plague of frogs on your whole country. And then the Bible says this, it's interesting, it says, Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts, magic. And they also made frogs come up in the land of Egypt. Now I think a better trick for these sorcerers would have, made, would have been to make the frogs disappear rather than have more come into the land. Nevertheless, the Bible references a number of, of instances where magic is used. Uh, if you remember when Moses first saw Pharaoh, he threw his staff down and it turned into a snake. And the magicians were able to do the same thing. In addition, not only the frogs, but later one of the plagues was the Nile turning into blood. And the magicians were able to do that as well. The difference between Satan's magic and sorcery um, and God's power is that God only allows sorcery to do what God allows. Some other examples in the book, um, in the book of Daniel, we read of Nebuchadnezzar and others in Babylon that regularly consulted magicians and enchanters and astrologers. Uh, these were called magi, by the way, the same word that we use for the wise men at Christmas. They, they were uh, magicians. The Bible warns us often about the dangers of consulting those who embrace magic or sorcery. We have to be very careful. Now listen to me. We have to be very careful because the proof is not in the pudding. Just because something seems to work doesn't mean that it's of God. Beware of being deceived. In the book of Revelation, the last book in your New Testament, there's a prophecy about the Antichrist as well as the beast during the time of what we call the, the tribulation. And we see that the false prophet will be able to do miracles with the intention of deceiving the whole world. In verse 13 of Revelation chapter 11, it says, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven uh, on the earth in the sight of men. And in verse 14 it says, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. You don't want to be deceived. The Bible says that in the last days many will be deceived. Now the best way not to be deceived is to get to know the, the real thing, the real power of God that can change our hearts, can heal our marriages, strengthen our families, and heal our land. So while Simon was a real sorcerer, his power did not come from God. But then Simon heard the gospel that was preached by Philip. Philip's message was simple. The Messiah had come. If you remember the conversation that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman at the well, she told Jesus, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus responded, I who speak to you am he. And then that, that account with the Samaritan woman says that she believed. So these people, when Philip gets to them, they are pre-evangelized. They had heard of the Messiah. It was part of their culture to believe that the Messiah was, was coming. Now Simon, it says, also believed, verse 13, and when he, then he was baptized and continued with Philip. Simon attached himself to Philip, noticing the signs, the wonders, the miracles, that Philip was able to do. So let's continue, and this is our last passage for today, so we're going to go all the way through verse 25. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they may receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet it had not fallen upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought in your heart may be forgiven. 
for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of God, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, there are two important, un two important understandings uh, for these, these verses I just read. The first is how important it was for the apostles to see the response of the people in Samaria. The scripture says the apostles heard and then they sent Peter and John. This is important because we said at this time the church is responding. The church is in transition. Up to this time it was a, a Jewish church and actually for many years after this visit by Peter to the Samaritans there would still be much discussion, much debate regarding Gentile Christians and what is expected. Should they follow the Jewish laws? Should the men be circumcised? Uh, what about the Sabbath? What about the dietary laws, what we know as the, the kosher laws? It was very important for Peter and John to see that the Samaritans truly believed and that the Lord had accepted them. They came to make an inspection and found that while these Samaritans believed, the signs and the wonders of the Holy Spirit had not been manifested. This requires a, a little explanation. The Bible is very clear that the Holy Spirit takes up resident in every believer when that believer is converted, is born again, when he or she believes. In fact, without the Holy Spirit, there is, there is no rebirth. There is no conversion. What the scripture is referring to here is the demonstration of the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in tongues, prophecy, and other manifestations. This is what the apostles experienced on, on Pentecost. The Bible makes reference to 3,000 and then 5,000, and we know there were multitudes that were added to the church. And it says that these believers were, they believed and they were baptized. Uh, there's no indication that every believer's experience was also accompanied by the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. However, when the apostles laid hands on these, on these new Samaritan believers, they received the Holy Spirit, meaning specifically that they manifested some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This sealed the deal for the apostles. who were, There was no doubt that God had accepted these Samaritans, these Gentiles. This also attracted the attention of Simon. What attracted his attention was the power of the, the Holy Spirit. Now then, what Simon decides is that he can, he can buy his way, he can use his money and buy this gift of laying on of hands and the power of the Holy Spirit. Of course, Peter rebuked him and said, your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You know, fortunately, Simon repents. However, history tells us that this, this practice of, of buying a gift or buying a church office for money was repeated often and actually became widespread in the medieval church. This practice is called simony or simony, which is the act of selling church offices and is named after this man Simon the sorcerer. One of the great problems in the medieval church was simony, the sale of ecclesial, ecclesiastical offices or church offices for money. These offices included the papacy, the cardinals, the abbots, and other ecclesiastical offices. Church offices were given to those with, with money and, and power. And for hundreds of years, very wealthy families purchased the, purchased the pope's office. Um, for their sons, often without regard to having these sons ever been ordained or having any inclination of, of serving God. Many times in the Middle Ages, godly reformers, including a few popes, tried to do away with simony, uh, but it was not until the Reformation that the practice was officially stopped. Martin Luther objected strongly to the practice of simony, in general and specifically to the selling of indulgences said to grant the contributor access to, to heaven. Finally, there is some debate as to whether Simon the sorcerer actually became a believer. Did he, actually get, did he actually get saved? Likely because of this 
sin of simony that is attached to his name. Um, I certainly wouldn't want any grave sin attached to my name, uh, but it was attached to Simon's name. However, this is where I stand. The Bible in verse 13 says, Then Simon himself also believed, and, when, and then he was baptized. So who am I to argue with what the Bible says? Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for this eighth chapter in the book of Acts. We thank you, Lord, that there's so much there that's going on. We thank you that we can see this church in transition. We can see the church moving from Jerusalem. And we give you all the praise and the glory for that in Jesus' name. I want to thank Amen. you for joining us today. Thank you for, thank you for being our friend. Thank you for your prayers and your financial support. On our website at www.faithdialogue.org, you'll find all of these, these video sermons as well as all of our audio podcasts. There's other things on our website too that will enable you to, to grow and to be able to, to get closer to the Lord. Today's benediction is from the New Testament book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good in order that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.